Welcome to Polycast, a civilization podcast focused on game strategy. Canis Albinas. Makalua. The Man Team. Mega Bears Fan. Hello, Internet, and welcome to Polycast episode 397. I am one of your regular co hosts, Mega Bears Fan, joined as usual by Canis Albinus. Uh, back in action, hopefully, back from whatever the heck I was doing before. No, no, nobody's allowed to know secrets. And Makalua. Only secret I have is I need more caffeine. And the me and team. Back from Grace Spawning Points. Oh, yeah. I've been playing that too. Yep. Very yep. good game. Didn't get very far because I had to stop many times to feed and take care of a baby, but such is the life now. <laughs> Yeah, that's one of the ones that would make it more challenging. It's uh, not turn-based. Yeah, no, no pause button. You know, nope. that didn't used to be a problem, but now it's much more of a problem. <laughs> Baby has no pause. Yeah, babies do not have pause or mute buttons, although the, the milk bottle is very close to a mute button. As it turns out, Elden Ring also does not have a pause button. Ooh. It was also surprisingly uh, way easier to... Uh, multitask with the baby and a video game at the same time when the baby was way smaller and could just sit on my chest. But now he's like way bigger and I have to actually hold him so that he doesn't like fall off. Wow. So yeah, it's, it'll eventually get easier somewhat, but only somewhat. Oh, it'll get harder for a while and then it'll get easier and then it will get way easier and then it will get made way harder and then they'll be on their own. Yeah. Okay. Well, so that way harder part, but okay. Yeah, let's go. So, this is not a Civ-specific topic, but it is something that occurred fairly recently and probably should be on people's radar. Um, City Skylines recently had a modder who was banned due to adding a hidden updater in one of his mods that exposed 35,000 people to malicious code. Now, this uh, story is dated on February 11th of 2022. But this guy um, built a mod framework that is used by several popular mods and uh, designed to help keep things um, compatible with them, with each other. And he put in a little automatic updater that allowed him to mine bitcoins on their computers. And then it also caused crippling performance problems in other mods that were competing to the ones he made. And there was also an issue where he was blocking certain Steam IDs from even seeing the mod itself. So anybody who worked at Steam or worked at Colossal Order, who were the developers, and um, the mods there were blocked I mean, out. Sorry. I was going to say, it's one thing when you put something in there. Just, to, I mean, it was bad enough the out trying to outcompete other mods by making them slow down, but then you add Bitcoin on top of that. Wow. Yeah. Well, even the first one if I'm not mistaken, is a crime. So <laughs> now I, I did read updates to this story like later on in that week. And it ended up, I think not being quite as bad as some of the initial reports suggest. Like I, I think they ended up not finding Bitcoin miners on anyone's machine. So I, I don't know if that actually happened or not. It seemed like most of what it was trying to do is it was destabilizing other mods. And then the modder was trying to get people to go to GitHub to download an updated version of the mod, and that potentially contained additional malware. So basically, he broke everyone's mods in order to try to get people to download a fix from outside of Steam. And uh, mm. so that that was the most updated version that I had read, uh, but that's still as of a few weeks ago. So, uh, But the bottom line is, uh, if this can be done in City Skylines over the Steam Workshop, it can potentially be done in any game, including hypothetically Civilization, uh, which is why we bring this up, because this is now something that has to be on the back of all of our minds whenever we're playing any Steam game uh, as, until, you know, Valve comes up with like a long term fix for it. And like I, I was like completely surprised. I thought for sure like Valve and Steam already had protections against this sort of thing happening, but uh, apparently not. 
I mean, I'm if, sure they put effort into that. It's just it's hard to never have any uh, security risks. Yeah. If if so he was directing mistake. people to GitHub to download something, then there's nothing Steam could have done about that one actually, because that's basically they're t- they're saying, hey, Steam has this protected thing. I want you to go over Steam's head and install this manually. Yeah. And but they yeah. still managed to interfere with other mods uh, using a mod, which does imply some degree of uh, security flaw. Yeah, and it's, I'm still a little unclear about what the exact extent of the Steam Workshop mod was, because, uh, you know, when, when the story first came out, they were talking about there being auto updaters and installing malware and stuff like that. And then I read later reports that said maybe there weren't auto updaters and he was just trying to, you know, redirect people to GitHub. So I, I don't know for sure whether or not this this um, particular the Steam Workshop version of the mod actually had auto updaters or not. Uh, I've I've never gotten like a surefire clarification on whether that was the case. Go ahead, Maggie. <clears throat> well, there was two things: is that one, he'd been in the community for a while, so people were somewhat surprised that that came out of him. You know, but that's something you have to be aware of. People are going to try to come into communities and build up trust, and then do an attack. You know, they're not just going to automatically troll. And GitHub in and of itself is not a bad thing necessarily, but you have to know you're dealing with a trusted source. And I, that's how he got people because he was a trusted source, you know, air, air quotes. So people didn't think twice about downloading from GitHub. Yeah, playing the long con. Yeah. The auto update is not included in the mod itself. It's part of Steam. Whenever you start a game with mods, it automatically checks to see if they're up to date. Well, Unless the, you the- manually tell it to stop. Right. Well, one of the things that I was reading in some of the initial reports was the idea that perhaps the mod installed an additional installer that was installing third party things from outside of uh, Steam. And I I think that is what turned out to not be the case. So but anyway, yeah, the the still the idea of uh, of modders trying to, you know, install malware through Steam or intentionally destabilizing the game in order to try to drive people to fix it through an outside source like oh man like the world we live in just sometimes sucks yeah Yeah, the devs have decided to do some Civ talking. <laughs> Best way to put that. Right. Yeah. There we go. They're talking about the past and future is told by its lead designers. You know, it's, it's just pointed out in the, the title. The, it's changed, changed many times, but certain things about Civ never changed because Civ actually turned 30 years old last year. You know, it's like me and other people going, oh, God, I was already a teenager at that point. What? You know, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't yet, but I wasn't that far either. <laughs> yeah, I was too. <laughs> I was a teenager when I started playing Civ, but that was with Civ 3, so... Yeah, I didn't play until Civ 2, so... I've been here since the beginning. Let me get my old Eddie Kane out. <laughs> no, not that old. <laughs> you, see, you see, kids, back when the internet had to make the weird screechy noises... We had to walk uphill both ways in the snow to get to our PC games. And we liked it. Yeah, so there are com- more competitors now. Humankind's a more direct competitor than it had in a while, because while there's some of the paradox stuff, it's not quite the same thing. Yeah, I don't think Civ has ever had a like competitor like on the same scale uh, until Humankind, because all the other games that I can think of always have like much narrower time periods in history that they focus on, or uh, you know, or, or they're yeah, they're just not quite. They they don't have the scope that civilization has back I, in the nineties. We had called a power. Oh, okay. Was that, Earth wasn't that like explicitly a knockoff of civilization though? It kind of was. Yeah. Yeah. But like, that's also then obviously tracked comp. Uh, comp- yeah. <laughs> there was uh, rise of nations, although that was a RTS rather than a, a PBS, but oh, if you go into RTS, then you also get age of empires and the like, but that's uh, sufficiently different gameplay than from Civ that, you know, every game is a competitor in a sense, but that's less so than, you know, other 4X turn-based strategy. I can't think of any other turn-based strategy 4X games that are control the whole world over time the way Civ is. 
At least yeah. none that aren't like set in a fantasy or sci-fi setting. Like you have like Master of Orion and uh, you know it was like Age of Wonders and Endless Legend and stuff like that. But none of them were had the historic basis that um, that Civ had on the same scale. Although if you look at the players who play each of those types of games, there is a ton of overlap. So certainly those do offer at least some degree of competition. Oh yeah, for sure. Civ's, Civ's always had a niche uh, for the most part. Until, yeah, it's got uh, it's got overall strategy competition, but not so specifically in the 4X thing. Well, historical uh, based wide scope, uh, you know, 4X. Uh, it's uh, certainly been plenty of turn based 4X comp, and even in tailored slash narrow parts of history, like a Bears fan mentioned. There's also fun quotes from the devs in here, like apparently John Schaefer played a pirated version his math teacher had, which is how he found out about right. Civ. <laughs> I was exposed to Civ through a uh, AP history teacher, so he, we didn't play the game in class. There was no pirating. He just talked about it in a lecture. I forget how I got it. I, I got straight up had a copy of Civ too. Uh, I think I have a similar story to Dan, where somebody saw me playing SimCity and said, "Hey, you might like this," and gave me the five dollar bo- version of Civ three at the time. Yeah, I think SimCity also served as a, a gateway game for for this sort of thing for me as well because i was real big into sim city before i got into civ and then i started doing the sims and i was very unhappy <laughs> well i i picked that one about the pirate i think because th- how i played it originally was technically you know massive air quotes pirated because back in the 90s when you would buy the games they would encourage you to make a backup copy in case the discs failed but what a lot of people did was swap backup copies like literally physically so i i had swapped I forgot what I swapped. What I swapped? I swapped my friend Wing Commander, and he swapped me Civ, and then I ended up buying Civ. So it actually sold games, even though it was pirating technically. Yeah, imagine that. Someone tries a game, likes it, and decides to buy it. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, especially if you give her a, give them a longer depth version than just a small short demo. I mean, good luck even finding a playable demo at this point, especially one before a video game comes out. Like it's a rare thing now. Yeah, that isn't especially a turn base that isn't gated to only like fifty turns or something like that. It's like, well, I can't tell how the end game is. I can't tell the middle game is. Come on, guys. Actually, yeah, nowadays the publishers expect you to pre-order the game a year in advance before you even know what the heck's going to be in the game. There's a whole thing on Steam right now, all about demos. There's like multiple hundreds of demos available on Steam right now. Yeah, Steam and, also uh, every now and then does the free weekend things where you can just play the whole game like for free for just a weekend, and then it comes becomes locked again if you don't buy it. Yeah, yeah. But I, I also read that this particular um, Steam upcoming game or upcoming games demo weekend has also been kind of a okay. Here's an example of how not to make a game demo. <laughs> well, they've been out of common practice in video games for a long time, so it doesn't surprise me that we're getting some woofers. Oh, we always I, got some woofer demos even back in the day. I think they're still they still exist. They're just not very common. Yeah, like well, I know, it's not common practice these days. I know Civ Five had a demo, and it was released when the first version of the game came out and never updated. So, if you want to get the real first ter- first release uh, edition of Civ Five and see what that was like, go play the demo. It's still on Steam, as far as I know. Yeah, it uh, it wasn't pretty. <laughs> no, it was very very rough. Indeed. Yeah, and both uh, Ed Beach and Anton Stringer both also started with Civ 3. So uh, Yeah, what's interesting in here is is they asked them questions about uh, what they think they did right and what they think they did wrong in their uh, respective um, games. And they've got, uh, they've got um, uh, what was his name, Johnson, what was his first name? I forget. Uh, uh, Soren. Yeah, yeah. They, they got, they got Soren Johnson, uh, Sh- uh, Sh- John Schaefer, Ed Beach, and Anton Stringer. And uh, what's funny is they asked... Uh, Soren Johnson, and he, he says, uh, it kind of, it sounds kind of bad to say, but I'm pretty happy with Civ 4. I don't think I could have done much differently or better in the situation. He said, uh, he said the only thing he could think of is maybe there's too many units. Yeah, I mean, stacks. That's kind of, you know, the intrinsic to how stacks are, you know, going to work. But, yeah. yeah. And even there, he did a pretty good job of uh, having mechanics that discourage them. Uh, and, the main problem there is that the AI never really played around that. And when you have stacks, like the management 
of stacks is still way easier than the management of, you know, one unit per tile if you've got a lot of units. Like, compare, you know, the stacks of Civ 4 to moving around even cores and armies in Civ 6, and it's way more tedious micromanagement in Civ 6 than it ever was in Civ 4. It's true, but a lot of that's the UI design of the newer games rather than the yeah, numbers of units or stack design. Because, like, you could have the exact same rules in Civ 5 or 6 and have a better UI, and you would you would catch up a lot uh, to Civ 4. Ed Beach says the problem is with Civ 6 is too many clicks required. Well, I agree yes. there. That's a big part of the UI. <laughs> but I don't think yeah. he means it in that way. He says... Um, <laughs> We felt like the adjacency bonuses probably got a little overcomplicated several expansions in, and some civilizations had lists with their bonuses that could get too long. Some things needed a little bit too microman- much micromanagement. Well, he does specifically call out trade routes, which is one of the more annoying ones, where you have to keep renewing them over and over and over again. Yeah. No, yeah, that's what we constantly complain about in the multiplayer. It's like, I have this trade route. I will let you know when I want to get rid of it. Or like uh, on diplomacy, especially when you have a treaty with another player, or even with the AI, we'll let you know when we're done with this treaty. Come on. Yeah, and you can also look to uh, Civ 4 for like that, or for uh, like loot production in this city, or just have the AI pick whatever, because you don't care anymore. The game is almost over. Yeah, those are all things you could do in previous Civ titles uh, to manage cities. Along with just having the cities editable from the city list. What uh, is really interesting, though, from Ed Beach in particular, is that the very next sentence is, so we've looked really hard at Civ Six and poked at it, and we're trying to do that sort of self-assessment pretty often around here, which uh, implies that they're already working on some kind of successor project. Well, it'd be strange if they weren't by now. <laughs> yeah, hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. <laughs> the game's been out a while, so there, there's, go, there's going to be some kind of project if the company's going to continue existing that they're looking at. Yep. And we could probably take a guess at what that is, but you know, even if it isn't, even if it's a different uh, different game, yeah. it's still like you would still take the lessons you learned from... Yeah, Sid good design Meyer, yeah. practice. Sid Meier's Civilization Before Earth. <laughs> 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 I thought that was called Sim... What it was it? Sim Earth? One of the one, yeah. Well, that's you have not to form before Earth, though. That's just earlier. That's yeah, not really a civilization Earth. game, though. Yeah, no, but now we're going to start with forming stellar bodies first and, you know, the Big Bang. And There is a game called that. It's called Solar 2, where you start out as mm-hmm. a rock. Yes. And you become a black hole. Hmm. And then you suck up the entire universe and start over. Spoilers. So it's like Katamari, but at a universal scale. Pretty much. Yes. Interesting. I'm sure that one has some fun with physics multiple times over just hearing it. It's uh, amusing. Yeah, try to aim at the thing you wanted to pick up and know you go way past it. Well, how exactly are we we influencing the outcome at all? But Yeah, Yeah, I know. Gameplay issues. (laughs) But anyway, to to get an idea of some of the the things that the people at Fraxis might be thinking of, uh, one of the things that Anton Stranger brings up is... uh, I was enamored with the idea of trade routes carrying resources. So you'd have a trade route going from London to Paris and you would put iron or horses on it. So it would be a way to use an extra luxury. You could throw it on a trade route and it would get you some income. So I wonder if that's uh, something that they might try uh, revisiting in the next game since they didn't get that uh, to work for Civ Six. You know, not just generic trade routes, but specifically to luxuries and other things. And if I recall correctly, that was kind of how the trade routes in Beyond Earth worked. Like, they actually sent strategic resources back and forth through the trade routes. But I don't, strategic I don't know if the resources, user... strategic resources. Bonus resources. Oh, was yeah. it only the bonus? Okay, yeah. I don't know if the, the user, though, had any control over what went in a particular trade route. Because I don't remember being able to, like, drag things onto the trade. I remember that in, like, colonization, in which case it was another bit of tedious micromanagement. Uh but Beyond Earth seemed to just have it all automated. They just need to bring in the Hearts of Iron for trains set up, lol. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Phil's trying to kill us all. Well, they do mention uh, Paradox Games further on in this interview here. Yeah, uh, some developers do. They also said that uh, it's for people who uh, feel they have aged out of civilization. Which yeah, I don't know if that's really true. And in I'm not... my mind, it's just people who want something more simulatory than um, fun. But see, my gut I, I, reaction. See, I don't would think be... that's a fair representation of the paradox games. No, it's not. I'm just 
Because they're, I mean, they have like simulation elements, but they are by far games first. And you can really tell that when you look at like what the top players do versus what even an average player does. Yeah, my gut reaction, though, would even be that y- you might expect players to go the opposite direction because, you know, as you you get uh, uh, older uh, and, you know, before you're retired anyway, you've got a lot more pressures for your time. So I would actually think that if you're aging out of civilization, it's because you have to play things that are less time consuming and and uh, less detailed and less intricate because you just don't have, you know, 40 80 hours a week to burn on a uh, video game the way you maybe did when you were in high school and you're you know home by 1 30 in the afternoon and have nothing else to do if you have yeah. 40 hours of a week to play uh games in high school you really should think about getting a part-time job yeah um, or <laughs> do an extracurricular start a, join a sport join a club or write a book or something but I, I mean, I played some online games, uh, you know, and that's definitely what it feels like. It feels like I am playing against people whose full time job is to just play that darn game. Oh, I really don't do. like multiplayer. You're probably not going against the people who are truly doing that, though, because those people are even a step above like the really good online, like, you know, jumps into a lobby type players. Part of it is a lot of the pay to win that goes on in online games nowadays. But uh, that's a yeah, totally different that too. But yeah, like I've I've been reasonably high level at a few different games competitively, and while you know I could even make the top one percent in some cases, uh, that is nothing compared to the people who are legitimately professional. <laughs> the difference between the, me and them is probably as large as between me and a beginner, and yeah. a lot of it's just the amount of time they put in. But they do treat it like a full time job too. Uh, it's not like uh, they're it's not like they didn't put the work in to get that. Yeah, when I play like an online shooter or something like a Call of Duty or a, a Battlefield or something like that, I'm just happy if my kill to death ratio is better than one to two. <laughs> you know, as long, <laughs> as long as it's not like one to eight, uh, I am usually pretty content with my performance. Yeah, like for an example of that, I had a game I, in Black Ops, which is a long time ago now. Uh, but uh, for a friend and I had a 40 game win streak in casual lobbies. Uh, just the two of us, you know, our teammates were random other than just the two of us, but we were good enough to win that many in a row anyway. And we'd routinely get three to one KDRs, uh, but that's, that's still junk compared to pros. <laughs> pros would mop the floor of this. <laughs> like that time you were playing, we were playing Rocket League and it was uh, the four oh, of yeah. us, brand new players and you who had been playing for like, what, 10 hours and... You I had a little bit more. I think I was in like the forty to fifty range, but yeah, I was able to soundly win defeated four of us at once. The funny until... thing about that is, even now where I'm like in diamond in Rocket League, I, like two of me can't beat my friend who's a grand champion. So there's a lot of skill in that, and he's significantly worse than the pros again. So yeah, that, that's you... just how it is with multiplayer. It's a shame you have to sell your soul to the devil to play that game now. Yeah, yeah. These days, if you're if you're not grandfathered in, then Epic is going to take your soul. And also anecdotally, with regards to the Paradox stuff and uh, real life, uh, I have family members who are married with children that used to play a lot more Crusader Kings before than they play now. And yeah, that that was cited as a reason. And it's also, the type, those are the types of games where it's difficult to just sit down and play for 15 minutes. Like It takes time to get your bearing even when you open up a save. Uh, so I don't think that uh, aging out is the issue here. Uh, I think the Paradox games just offer things that the Civ games don't that are attractive to a subset of the potential fan base in either case. Because, yeah, like you could play a Paradox game for like a half hour, but you're barely getting anything done. Whereas, like, if a good session is like two to four hours, but most people don't have that kind of time. Yeah, for example, the Crusader King games in particular not only have the the simulation aspect going on, but there's also a large like role playing element to them too. So if you like Civilization and you also like you know RPGs or something like The Sims, where there's a lot of opportunity for character role play, then Crusader Kings is probably right up your alley. Beautiful also, hours. those games attract a fan base that want them to be more simulation than they are. Uh, to my frustration personally. Uh, so there are a lot of people who like to think it's more simulation than it is in Paradox games. Do you have any idea how many berries I could water in Pokemon in two to four hours? Man, I'd be rich. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if only my in-game balance is translated to real life. But you would not get a one-tag World Conquest that way. Yeah, talk about uh, gaming as a job. Yeah, when you play those games that basically are just a, a job, that's uh, definitely uh, kind of ironic that some games do that. 
Well, it's just spend 20 minutes a day to water your berries. Yeah, no, I, I know. I get it. Um, but anyway, yeah, this uh, this interview thing with the, the Civ designers, there's also later on, there's a bit where they ask each of them what they are most proud of in their respective games. And that was kind of interesting, too, to see what uh, or to read what each of them had to say. Uh, for Soren Johnson, it was the idea that uh, culture uh, influences borders. And uh, of course, for John Schaefer, it was the one unit per tile uh, concept. And uh, for Ed Beach, it was the idea of trying to make every single tile uh, on the board significant in some way, you know, through the adjacency bonuses and districts and so forth. Yeah, Six really did a pretty good job of making the train more meaningful again. Anton oh, yeah, Stren- absolutely. Anton Stranger says he likes the historical moment system. Oh, yeah. it's part of the Golden Ages? Yeah. Well, um, like, you built the first airplane, or you built the first boat. And it gets an illustrated moment on your timeline, which well, I agree is pretty cool. But I mean, for one thing, it, it's nice to have as a recap, especially at the end of the game, along with all your charts and graphs and stuff like that. Like, it's nice to see that kind of, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily go as far as to call it a narrative, but, you know, that that arc of, of what your civilization did. But also just to kind of put in perspective, like how significant like that um, the idea of the historic moments is like uh, humankind uh, amplitude studios basically took that idea and made it the scoring system for the game that determines the winner. So uh, yeah, it is a, an interesting idea. Well, Civ has had that for a long time. It's called the score victory and it's the, you couldn't win any other way victory. Well, but it's, it's also the idea of having like discrete things that you do that give you points. Whereas the, the score for, um, for civilization has always been geared more around like just increasing your population and, and land area and stuff like that. And then they also get points for wonders and stuff like that. But the, the score for civilization didn't give you points for things like negotiating trade agreements or being the first to circumnavigate the globe or anything like that. Uh, the way that uh, humankind will give you points for those things. But yeah, you're, you're right. It is similar. Should we move to our next topic? Yeah, because we, we, we don't, we're going to end up with an entire podcast off this one topic. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, top 10 list from our very own Mega Bears fan, both uh, good and bad ideas, uh, Civilization Retrospective. Not sure why I'm introducing this rather than you, Jason, but... Uh, because there's two of them, and he's introducing the other one. Okay. Well, I still feel like he, he could probably introduce his own thing the best. But well, do you enough. know what? Why don't we go ahead and do it that way? Yeah, do you well, mind, go. Jason? <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, so since uh, Civilization VI looks like it's done, uh, we haven't heard anything new in terms of new content or plans for the game for almost a whole year now, right? Like, what, last May was when uh, New Frontiers ended? Something like that? I believe uh, so, yes. I thought I would, you know, take a look back at the games or at the game and think about the things that I most liked about it and the things that I most disliked about it and do some little retrospectives on it. So I uh, made both a YouTube video, well, a pair of YouTube videos and also a pair of uh, blog posts for those who prefer to read instead of uh, uh, watch videos. So whichever is your preference, uh, there'll be links to both. Uh, so I did top 10 good ideas and then another for top 10 bad ideas. And uh, one thing that's important to note about this is there are actually some ideas that show up on both lists because I thought they were really good ideas in principle, but really bad ideas in execution. And, um, you know, we'll get to those in a bit. So uh, the first thing in my my good ideas, uh, number 10, was the uh, musical score. Uh, Civ 6 has an absolutely outstanding uh, soundtrack and is, I would say, uh, you know, Baba Yetu, notwithstanding, easily the best in the entire series. And I would be very surprised if anybody would disagree with me on that one. Civ 5 is also really good. But yes, Civ 6 is the best. Yeah, like the way that the, the scores like change over time to reflect the the progress of the civilizations through the different eras. Like that's a really neat touch. Uh, and just there, like almost every track is just really, really good. And there are several that become absolute earworms for me, and I'm humming along to them for hours after playing the game. Uh, ironically, one of them is the Scottish theme, which has friggin' bagpipes in it. And, like, the idea of liking a piece of music with bagpipes in it, I did not think I would ever like uh, like something. I, I do not like the sound of bagpipes. But Bagpipes that- are awesome, and you are wrong for thinking they are <laughs> not good. 
Uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm just listening to the wrong bagpipe music because apparently there's some good ones out there. But uh, uh, this is the first that I heard that I actually really, really, really liked. So Scotland, the Brave is a really good song. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Uh, and then the next topic is uh, the leader agendas. Uh, and this is going to be one of the ones that will show up on both uh, lists. And basically, I really like the idea of having some custom tailoring of the UIs, uh, or not the UI, of the um, the AI leaders, so that they potentially play to their strengths and you know actually know how to use their uniques in the way that those uniques are intended to be used, as opposed to just kind of like guessing and hoping hoping they you know do things correctly by coincidence, which is kind of the way that it used to work. Uh, it's a really good idea on paper, but unfortunately, it is one of those ideas that I mentioned that kind of didn't work out too well in practice. Yeah, um, I think as a concept, that's there's it's good. Yeah, for sure. The AI needs some flavoring in addition to the agendas so that they don't all act the same. Well, I think they do have both. It's just they it, I, th- I think a big part of the problem was just how the agendas themselves were structured um, led to some like un- awkward and unexpected behaviors. And we'll get to that later. I'm pretty sure that the um, the flavor system has not is not in Civ Six, but I do not have hard evidence on that other than somebody on the forum a couple topics ago saying that. Oh yeah, maybe I don't know. I, I had assumed that they were working to complement each other, but yeah, maybe not. Well, the AIs don't really act any different from each other in my experience, except for their their little agenda. So. I, I would say that at the very least, the aggression level of the AIs seems to be something that is different from AI to AI. But I don't know if that's something that is rolled into the agenda. I don't know. I get declared on by Gandhi a lot. Hmm. <laughs> but anyway, uh, num- the number eight good idea for me was the idea that uh, infrastructure and city defenses require a continual investment. You have to continually pop out new builders and new civilian units in order to, you know, create additional improvements and stuff like that, as opposed to just building your entire civilian workforce at the start of the game and then having them for the entire game. Uh, And it especially works well with the like disaster mechanics and stuff like that, where you need to have civilian workers on hand to fix those things. And in like Civ five, we just had the old workers mechanic. Like you would just have an army of workers just standing around doing nothing just waiting for a flood or something to pillage your farms. And it would just be trivial uh, to fix. So I thought that was a really good idea. Uh, Number seven is that I liked that there is a full fledged reconnaissance unit line. Like this is something that has been annoying me for a long time in the civilization games. Civ four at least had, I think one upgrade to the scout. The scout became an explorer unit in the Renaissance. Yes. But like other than that, scouts have, yeah, late medieval, early Renaissance, something like that. Uh, I mean, and Civ Four also had like a much more um, like emergent technology tree where there weren't quite the hard divisions between eras as like there are in Civ Five and Civ Six, but that's a that's a different topic. Um, but yeah, it's nice to have scouts that are actually useful for longer than the first fifty turns of the game. Um, that's always been a pet peeve of mine. Man, I rarely use them in combat, though. Well, now they're I mean they're a little bit more viable in combat. Like your skirmishers are still going to get pretty. Uh, owned if you come across like a horde of barbarians but you know for the most part they can hold their own if you just wander into a single errant barbarian Uh, but you still kind of have to like put them in groups in order to support each other if they're out by themselves or have them supported by some mounted units if you're doing that you might as well build actual military units at that Uh, point yeah, perhaps. Although if you can get to that ambush promotion, which is the plus 20% combat st- or plus 20 combat strength, uh, then you, that unit is going to be pretty darn potent in combat. Yeah, I mean, they're they're not awful. I just. <laughs> I but also they have to be they, they have to be somewhere where you can get them upgraded, though. That's the problem with the scouts. You want them out there in the middle of nowhere scouting things and then, well, they never come home to get upgraded. Uh, yeah, you might have to bring them home to get them upgraded, but at least you can upgrade them and continue using them as opposed to previous games where you bring them home and you either disband them or just camp them in your city for the rest of the game and do nothing with them. Man, I'd leave them in uh, rival civilizations with open borders so I can get some idea of what's going on. Yeah, you can do that too. I mean, that's been a thing for ages and it's still a good idea in Civ 6. I mean, it, yeah, it's, it's just going to die like as soon as conflict begins, but yeah. Yeah, but like... It gives you advance warning of like stuff mounting up on your borders. 
Yeah, and before you have spies available, that's definitely one way to go. Well, plus the like spies are much more precious slash limited in what they are doing than like a junk unit that basically doesn't cost maintenance that you can just throw around all over the place that lets you see things uh, far in advance of both them arriving at your borders. And plus, it might just give you information that they're attacking somebody else or stuff's out of position, whatever. Like that kind of information is useful, less so in single player because you kind of know how the AI acts. But uh, as a unit, Scout's role in my mind has not changed very much uh, since early Civ two, Civ six. But it's still a good uh, role that it's serving. It's an inexpensive unit that gives you information and has some special abilities in that role that the other units do not have. So, like, the skirmisher stuff and, you know, the combat bonuses, those are all, like, nice-to-haves that were added, but its fundamental role in the game is, in my opinion, unchanged and still good. Yeah, I mean, I like to use them, actually, to go out and hunt uh, barbarians. I'll usually take, like, two or three of them as a group and go out and try to find barbarian outposts and, um, you know, pillage them for the gold and stuff like that. So having a unit that has comp- competitive combat strength uh, definitely helps with that. And I can keep my like actual military units where they're you know more useful against potential uh, rival civilizations. But that's a playstyle preference thing. Uh, so number six was the idea that diplomacy isn't completely toothless anymore. Uh, the idea of having the, like emergencies and stuff like that, where you can actually build coalitions to go after uh, snowballing opponents. Uh, that is a really good idea that I hope gets further fleshed out in later games and also the idea of having alliances that level up over time so that you actually have a reason to maintain those alliances and not just you know backstab the other player if uh, the opportunity arises i think that's a positive addition to the game uh, diplomatically yeah they really needed the tangible benefits and while i think it's certainly not perfected this is a major improvement Yes, it is a very big step in the right direction. It would be nice if you could do those like emergency coalition stuff and actually coordinate with the other civilizations on how to uh, resolve those. Uh, Because right now that I think is the the biggest thing that's missing that makes those things just not work as intended. So hopefully in future games, they can find a way to resolve that. Coordinating with AI, man. I mean, at the very least, just putting like a pin on the field that says, you know, target this, you know, area or this city or something like that, like would be helpful. The AI struggles to do that, even when the target is explicitly a city that was captured. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> so I, I think they, uh, the only way to reconcile that will be to make the AI play through the game a little better. Yeah. Yeah. Well, fingers crossed. As a mechanic, as a mechanic design, uh, it's good. It just it needs the AI to catch up to it. Like uh, quite a few mechanics. Yep. Uh, My number five good idea uh, actually mirrors something that the uh, lead developers of the game actually said, which is uh, the idea of the world feeling more like a like living dynamic character. Uh, The map just plays so much more of an important role in Civ 6 compared to previous civilization games, not only because of the adjacency bonuses of districts, but also because the geographic features of the map and, you know, the things like disasters and stuff like that, that actually, you know, where the world itself reacts and responds to uh, how you're playing, either through disasters or the climate change mechanic. Uh, You know, we haven't seen anything like that since, you know, Alpha Centauri. And obviously it's not to the scale of Alpha Centauri, but it's it's good that the board itself poses a challenge to the game as opposed to just the AIs. It's definitely a step in the right direction. Oh, okay. Uh, Step in the right direction. Yeah. And then following up on that, my number four good idea was the idea of the climate change itself being like a core mechanic and not just this kind of like afterthought that they throw in if they throw it in at all at the very end of the game, uh, where this is, you know, kind of following through on both the idea of the, the world being a living character almost and also the idea of there being, you know, more diplomatic reasons to like cooperate, like having a global problem that every player on the map is concerned with and has to address is also something that really facilitates, you know, diplomatic play and also, you know, helps to give you something to do late in the game. Uh, You know, it's still not a whole lot because you can still kind of basically ignore climate change. Uh, But yeah, that's another thing that I'll talk about in the next list. Uh, My number three 
best idea was the uh, Barbarian Clans game mode. Uh, I really like that this takes the idea of barbarians and kind of humanizes them a little bit more. I've always kind of thought it was, you know, um, a little odd, uh, problematic that barbarians have been treated like, you know, almost like wildlife or a force of nature. They've been completely dehumanized in previous games. They're just like mindless zombies that go around the field pillaging and, and stuff like that. And it's nice that the barbarians clans mode actually made it so that you can, you know, to an extent negotiate with them. And it gives them kind of this like unique cultural identity where they each have like their own specialized units that they build and uh, stuff like that. It, I think that's also a step in the right direction kind of thing towards um, not only treating barbarians more as human beings, but also the idea of modeling, you know, more tribal or nomadic or pastoral peoples and uh, considering that a legitimate way of living in the civilization games. Yeah. And as they have time to grow or they pillage on certain things or you buy units from them, they have that meter and they slowly go that until they become a city state, which makes sense. They get more organized. They have more stuff to work with. And I suppose maybe if you didn't, you're talking about the pastoral life. There are still tribes and civs in real life who have never civilized air quote. Yeah. There, we, are, there are still yeah. nomads and pastoralists still today. Yeah. If we had a reflection that, no, this way. yeah, if maybe not every barbarian clan civilized or something like there was a role, maybe one in 10 didn't, it would be a little more real world reflective. Well, most of them don't make it, right? In Civ Six, <laughs> <laughs> well, if they're not close to you, and there's ones that pop up on islands and things like that, so yeah. But I'm, that's what I'm getting at. Like the game does have some way of modeling why uh, some of them don't develop into civilizations of any sort, and uh, that's because uh, for a very similar reason to history, they get outcompeted by things near them in a way that's not so nice sometimes. Yeah, and I, I will stay, say that I, I do still think it is a little bit problematic that these barbarians become, quote, civilized by founding yeah. a city and turning into a city-state, because as we said, there are still nomads and pastoralists alive today, and the idea that the barbs have to become a city-state in order to not be, quote, barbarians anymore, that that's still a little problematic. It would be nice if they so. could... Not in the scope of the game, because, uh, like... Look at the Mongols, for example, and how they're represented in game. If there's uh, just some limitations with what Civ Five is capable of, or Civ Six is capable of modeling versus not. Uh, so, like, if you want them to be a relevant force, you need them to interact with the game mechanics. So, unless you're willing to expand the scope of the game outright uh, just to represent uh, nomadic uh, civilizations or whatever. Uh, it wouldn't make sense. And if you are willing to do that, then quite a few civilizations in the game would take up that mechanic before the quote unquote barbarians or lesser uh, historical nations would. Well, uh, agreed. And, and I'm talking about more in terms of like for future Civ games. Like I said, I think this is a step in the right direction where maybe they take this further and there actually are like proper nomadic civilizations and nomadic tribes that are basically like city states, but which don't have cities. But then how do you model like technology in a nomadic nation over time? Because uh, like they were tech competitive for some time due to their interaction with other uh, civilizations. But at some point, you need the industry uh, to keep uh, keep up in technology. And that just wasn't a thing in our history. So I don't know if you could do that in game. Maybe. Maybe there's a way you could do it. Or maybe you can have them choose... Well, in the context of a of a playable civilization, like you could still have systems where they form temporary settlements and then, you know, accumulate yields in the traditional sense, like kind of how, uh, you know, the Maori uh, Maori start the game. Uh, and there's other games that have done this before, like uh, Total War Attila had, you know, the Huns and other uh, cultures in the game be actual nomadic civilizations that would, you know, either conquer a city and then raise it to the ground and keep going, or they would form temporary settlements for several campaign turns that would accumulate, you know, yields and build things and stuff like that. And I, I could see civilization doing a similar thing, although, you know, it would have to be obviously designed from the ground up to work with the turn-based, you know, uh, mechanics and the, you know, broader scope of the game. And it would have to be balanced in a way that has yet to be accomplished. Because I would like to point out that the Huns do not operate on the same rules you operate on in uh, Total War Atella. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. To challenge, they are, they're given some pretty ridiculous uh, ways to bypass otherwise restrictive game rules. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, we've already have seen a potential model for this in civilization in the form of the, the aquatic cities in Beyond Earth, which could move periodically. Uh, uh, I don't know if that would really work for someone like the Mongols, but, you know, it, it's at least an idea. And there is a proof of concept already in the civilization franchise. Well, the Mongols did eventually settle down, though. They did, yeah. And uh, they, True. their descendants ruled several countries for hundreds of years after that. So, Yeah, almost universally, uh, outside of uh, Central Asia, when the nomadic... Once uh, they left the area where nomad nomadism was really needed to survive, they stopped being nomads. Yeah. Like, the reason why nomadism still exists is because some places are just unsuited to permanent habitation. Right. But those places in a civilization map would still be permanently settled. I mean, we you know talk all the time about the desert and tundra snowball cities that don't really make a whole lot of uh, sense. Well, that's because the AI settles them. Players don't usually. <laughs> I always uh, kind of abstracted those as, yes, there's a city on the map, but they're actually living all around that area. And that's just the administrative center. Sort of like how out in the west of the U.S. there's a whole bunch of straight lines on the map that divide things, but if you actually go out there, there's all kinds of things that actually delineate borders. Oh yeah, and that's kind of how civilization already abstracts cities anyway, through the idea of like improvements and stuff like that. Like you, you build all those farms, there's people living on those farms. All of your population isn't just in the city center. Yeah. But anyway, like I said, I think the barbarian clans thing is a step in the right direction. It is nice to see that the barbarians are not just mindless, you know, hordes. They're actually, you know, treated to a certain degree now as, like, people. Uh, and I, I would definitely hope that uh, future Civ games go more in that direction. And then my number one, you know, pa favorite good idea on this list was the representation of, of new cultures and leaders. Uh, I really liked how Civilization VI, like, kind of made it a point of emphasis right from the start to uh, use civilizations and leaders that we haven't seen a bunch of times in previous civilization games. A lot of them are from the, you know, the forum topics, the, you know, people start the threads, like the why no insert civilization name here uh, threads. And they, they pull a lot straight from there. And, you know, I've, I've always used civilization as like a way of introducing myself to some of these historic, uh, you know, cultures and, and characters and stuff like that. So it's very nice to, you know, see a, a wider variety and not just have, you know, Caesar and Napoleon and, you know, all of them again, you know, for the umpteenth time. Uh, in particular, I, I really liked learning about uh, Tamiris of Scythia. Like, I really liked that historic anecdote of, you know, her epic story of revenge against Darius of Persia. Uh, that, that has since become one of my favorite historic anecdotes, even though it's, there's a strong possibility that it's, uh, you know, not actually historically true because there's, you know, different competing accounts of how that all went down, but it's still a really neat story. And I wouldn't have ever probably heard about it if, uh, she hadn't been included as a leader in civilization six history. Like people always talk about, well, well, this story is apocryphal. And I'm like, when you're talking about things, 2000 years in the past, who cares? It doesn't matter. All that matters is the story we have to tell us of who these people were. Because who cares whether they actually did one or two different things or if it was slightly different. We don't even know what people were doing 50 years ago, let alone now. So it doesn't well, matter. In the case of Tamiris, the competing stories aren't just little differences. They're like fundamental differences. It's a question of whether or not she actually married Darius and they lived the rest of their lives together or she murdered him. Uh, in a war because she refused the proposal of marriage. So, but it's still like, two thousand years in the past. So, yeah. yeah. But the like, takeaway from that story is one woman got pissed off and went on a rampage with her horses. And that I part would, we know is solid. Yeah, and and if if Hollywood ever wants to make that movie, I will totally watch that movie on opening weekend because it sounds like it would be an awesome movie. I'm afraid it would just be too lewd because you can't have Hollywood, Hollywood. do a movie about. A woman in history without it showing boobs it's historical we can show boobs <laughs> absolutely gotta get those dollar signs now we skipped also, one of these by the way we went oh, from number we? three to number two. Oh, that yeah number two is a really really small one oops <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> yeah, number two was also kind of piggybacking on the idea of the barbarian clans feeling more human. It was the idea of the city-states now having their own unique abilities similar to the full civilizations. So there's now a modeling of the specific city-state cultures as uh, as well as, you know, various barbarian cultures. And that's actually based on, you know, loosely on their historic uh, uh, realities. So... You know, another way of modeling cultures that don't quite make it into the game as playable civilizations, uh, you put them in as city-states, give them a unique power, and there's, you know, still some modeling of their historic cultures, uh, which is also a very good idea. So, yeah, anything else to anyone wants to say about those? Well, you do mention in the article the uh, moving of one leader between civilizations in the game. Yeah. I, yeah, I do think the setup uh, that Civ Six created for uh, leaders and also separating bonuses into the leader specifically a little bit more than just the traits uh, from Civ 4. Those are ideas that you can build off of. I, right, yes. I think I figured out by looking at some of the code why they only have a couple of those leader, uh, sep- multiple leaders per Civ. And the reason is because in the code, they actually have to be separated by civilization. So there are technically three different French civilizations in the code. One for Magnificent Catherine, one for Regular Catherine, and one for Eleanor. So it's not as um, robust as we originally thought it was. It's not like the Civ Four system where multiple leaders are expected. So Mm. I'm pretty sure that's why there's been limited use of that functionality. I see. Oh, well, in that case, that actually does answer one of the questions that I had, which is why uh, if they kept they they changed the roosevelt and catherine personalities so that they could put in new um uh new leader abilities for them because i guess you know people didn't like the old ones or they were too weak or whatever but i always wondered why they didn't just do that with england because they completely replaced england's uh civilization ability so if if all the alternate leaders are just alternate civilizations in the game code i don't know why the heck they couldn't have just had an alternate england with a different ability as well because England's original ability was not good, and it didn't synergize with the way the game worked after the second, exp- or after the expansion packs. I uh, I guess England was routinely considered the Georgia of the original game. No offense to Tabalsi. They need to make a combined Greater Georgia that includes the country, the U.S. state, and the island. <laughs> that would be Georgia on my mind. Oh. Exactly. I also I wanted it. to give uh, a, a runner-up award to the idea of putting a clock in the uh, UI for Civilization VI. Uh, that should be in every uh, turn-based strategy game, like, moving forward. It used to be I, in Civ IV. <laughs> yeah, I... You turned it on, yeah. Yeah, it was an option, I think, in the game settings. In Civ V, you had to get a mod for it, but... Uh, yeah, it, it's it's nice to be able to look up in the corner and be like, oh, crap, it's two in the morning and I have work tomorrow. I I need to actually for super realsies do one more turn and then save and quit. <laughs> the real one more turn. Yeah, well, the real nice. one more turn. Especially please stand if up. you are still playing off of one monitor on your computer, or you're like playing a laptop or something. Yeah, when I'm at home on my desktop. I can just look at my other screen. But if I'm on a laptop or something, then not really. I played Civ on my laptop once, and now it blue screens every day. I hate it. Ooh, ouch. As a as a general rule, if you feel like your laptop is getting a little hot while playing a game, don't ignore that, because it will ruin the motherboard. Or something else. It'll, something will... Uh, something uh, is broken. Something yeah, is I, broken. I eventually fried my laptop with Civ 4 back in the day, so... I, I it's laptops the, that are capable of handling these games, but they you have to be uh, they're usually made custom order or whatever, unless yeah. you want to go like really high price. I have you a can, dedicated gaming laptop that I use for all my gaming, pretty much. They do yeah. sell gaming laptops at relatively good prices, considered to considering uh, how good they can do. But they careful, Mackie. It sounds like thunder. Sorry, sorry. I was trying to move the mic. I should have muted. <laughs> okay. Um, the problem with um, having uh, laptops like that that play video games is you really want to be careful with them because the one I bought cost $1,500 and now it blue screens all the time. Like, oh yeah. man. 
Also, don't yeah. expect your battery to uh, work very well because once oh, yeah. you start playing games <laughs> off the battery, it's going to drain that battery in like 20 minutes and like permanently uh, lessen your battery life. So it basically just becomes a mobile desktop because you always have to have it plugged in. Yeah, yeah anytime if, you're, to... if you're gaming, that's pretty much what you want is a yeah. mobile desktop. Uh, and you t- you're kind of forced into that trade off. If you yeah. want it to be able to play the games decently at all without frying, then you're going to sacrifice uh, for it. Get one of those yeah. things that has a fan on it, on the on, so that you can sit it on a fan top. Yep, I have one of those too. Yep. I didn't, and now I pay the price. Yeah, but yeah. The best I could do, because uh, I was looking, uh, I was researching some stuff uh, for my niece to get a laptop for her. I think we got something pretty good around eleven hundred dollars last summer. Yeah. You can get a good gaming laptop for around a thousand dollars these a days. a gaming laptop per se. I like order like a, I went through a website that was like piecing together like what you want in your laptop, and, and there, you know I was able to make the trade offs there. And there are also plenty of stock laptops that you know would probably run most games fine on lower graphic settings because remember, there's also a lot of laptops that are intended for you know doing like video editing and and you know image editing and stuff like that, yeah. like Photoshop and Premiere and things that you know, have pretty beefy specs and are more than capable of handling, uh, you know, almost any game on the lower medium graphic I settings. Be careful. It's pretty hard to find something with uh, enough RAM, enough graphics card RAM and a card that can handle like there's the, there's a major balancing issues there. I would say um, you can get gra- you can get laugh lap. Excuse me. You can get laptops with game with um, gaming graphics cards. For around a thousand up to two thousand on a laptop, yeah. uh, you can turn you turn the settings down and the game will work fine. If you only have an HD thirty five hundred or so integrated graphics chip, you probably don't want to play anything super difficult to run on that because yeah. that will fry your processor and that is worse than frying the RAM because that means the whole computer is just dead and needs a new brain. Yeah. Definitely don't try to do that on your work laptop. <laughs> yeah, don't <No>. do that. <laughs> no civ at work laptop. <laughs> All right, and to close up our show today, we actually have some mail that came in. We don't usually get emails that often. Uh, to the point where I have routinely not looked at the email uh, client and thus missed this one for almost a month. This came in um, January 1st or 2nd. Uh, it comes from someone named Tristan. I'm not going to give the last name because I assume they probably don't want that coming out. But it says, Hi guys, love your show, been a listener since five years. Haven't played Civ for a while and fired it up. Thought I'd try something different and a bit easy. Chose Japan and thought I'd do a real world map for the change. True start location was not what I was expecting. Any tips on what start strategy to use when you're on a small island? I keep finding I keep finding I had nothing to build while I waited for naval tech. Well, this has been an issue in Civ games for some time, man. I remember Dan with his one tile island. <laughs> one X island, oh my gosh. And, and even more so of an issue in Civ 6 with the unstacking of districts where you can't reliably just build a city on a one tile island because then you literally have no room for districts except for a harbor. Yeah. Yeah. And on, a, on the um, true earth start or true location start, I believe if you're not playing on the super huge map, Japan is like three tiles. Yeah, but you can also reach with. the Chinese coast, at least, even though you can't develop it. Well, yeah, but the, his his thing is he doesn't know what to build while he's getting the naval text to get off of his island. Which yeah, you need to be able to embark pretty quickly. Yeah. So, like, what can what can you build realistically? I mean, the ability to improve whatever uh, sea resources mm-hmm. you have available. And, uh, you know, maybe a unit or two to explore once you're capable of embarking, maybe a worker, but like, what else? Like, can you build? I mean, I guess like you can go for some otherwise suboptimal build order. Like you don't need, um, you don't need a whole lot of military units right away. So you can definitely get away with, uh, producing, you know, like a monument earlier than you might otherwise, but it, no matter what you do, you're going to have a slower start with a start position like that than you would otherwise. Uh, just because until you can embark and start settling cities elsewhere, you're limited. 
I think there are two techs you need to embark. There's like the one tech that allows you to embark workers and then a second tech that requires you to embark settlers. Mm. Correct. So, yeah, celestial yeah. navigation, I think. And I think they're both classical techs. So they're available yeah. fairly early. And if you um, you can boost them pretty easily if you have a coastal or island start, because one of them is boosted by, I think, like building two galleys. And the other one yeah. is boosted by, I think, building like two, improving two sea resources or something like that. Um, it sounds the, like what he's... Is you're not going to have a lot of production. It's just, it's going to be slow. Like if you have a bad first city, which you're kind of guaranteed if you have a three tile island. It, you're going to be slow. Well, you definitely want to hope you can get an early Pantheon so you can take God of the Sea and get some production from all your sea resources because that's probably going to be your only source of production. Um, probably. Um, so basically, you just want to build galleys, those. I guess. You build a worker and then build some, or builder and then build some galleys while you're waiting for the world to open up. Yeah. I yeah, mean, well, what choice do you have otherwise? Yeah, because otherwise you're going to build like a warrior and then another warrior and then another warrior and oh, you're out of land. And you're just going to sit there. Well, also, you're going to be probably pop capped. So you maybe could go ahead and build your first or second settlers and have them ready to go as soon as you can embark. Yeah, for sure. Like you want to get those things done. So you're not waiting after you have the embarkation tech. Uh, you also want to build a harbor to get the second embarkation tech. Because I believe uh, Celestial Navigation gets its bonus from a harbor. <laughs> well, I mean, what else are you going to build? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, it's all going to be slow. There's no way around it. That's going to be a slow start. And one of the other things that can be problematic for um, coastal or island civilizations in Civ Six is because of the way that cities, districts are unstacked, uh, you're not necessarily guaranteed that other um, civilizations or city states are going to have their cities right on the coasts, which means even doing things like sending trade routes for gold uh, isn't necessarily going to be guaranteed because if those cities are even just one or two tiles inland and they haven't built a harbor yet, you're not going to be able to trade with them. Yeah. So if you do find a coastal trade partner who you can trade with, like definitely send trade routes to them and probably don't conquer them because they're going to be your only trade partner for quite a while. Also, build a navy so you can protect the trade routes. Well, once you <laughs> if you conquer them, you would then have a path to trade with other people, though. Yeah, I guess that's true. But realistically, as soon as you can embark settlers and start settling the mainland, you'll be able to work from there. And hope very strongly that Korea and China are not your neighbors. Well, if they are, now you're probably building military units. I mean, what else can you do? And also hope that the Maori don't just show up and settle right where you were going to uh, settle. Yeah. <laughs> Coupe. It would probably be pretty hard if uh, China and Korea are there already for Coupe to come up. I'm not sure that if China and Korea were on the same map, they could actually settle in their true star locations. Because I think the Beijing tile and the Seoul tile are too close together for that. Depends on the map size too, right? Yeah, but we were talking a smaller one. Even on a huge map, they're pretty close. Yeah, but I think they would fit then. Yeah, they would. I think. I don't know how big Korea is in the true start, true location start map on huge. Well, and on a smaller map, you're not going to have all the civilizations in the game anyway. So, like, what are the yeah. odds of having you know Japan and China and Korea and potentially the Maori all in the same uh, game on a smaller normal size map? And bo or both Mongolias. Let's see, how many leaders are there? They're like 60 leaders. Yeah, there's quite a few now. So that would be 60. And then you have both Korea, both um, China's, both Mongolia's. So that's four. Um, you've got Korea and Maori. So that's six. So it would be one in 10 that one of that any one of them would also be there with you. That being said, though, um, does the game, how does to the true star location uh, handle if people are starting too close to each other? Like if uh, if two star locations on the map are not capable of both settling due to the city distance rules, will true star location remove one of those civilizations from generation? I do not or think so. Or will it place them differently? I think it will just put them where they're supposed to be and whoever goes first in the turn order gets to settle and whoever doesn't has to move and find a place otherwise they can't settle oh man that'd be brutal for japan <laughs> well <laughs> you're too close lol 
the human player has the uh, the first turn always in a yeah. you know single player game, so you don't have to worry about that. Oh wait, is it like Civ Four still with the city placement uh, versus like the distance rules are ignored if it's across water? I no, I don't think so. I want to say I've seen something similar to that that might be true, but I can't guarantee it. I think it might be false. Mm, okay. I've seen some strange things in my time though. Because that would be a real screwed up thing, especially for non-player Japan to like just not be able to settle your city, your first city, because of the spawn location. That, that shouldn't be a thing. Well, and especially, yeah, if you are Japan and you're on an island and you can't leave that island because you're not the Maori and you don't have embarkation yet. Yeah. Well, if one, if the the close Chinese city is like, oh, I'm going to buy that tile, the warrior will, or the, the settler will eventually teleport somewhere. Yeah, potentially halfway across the world. Yeah, you're, you're, the game is over already, basically. Yeah, there's, there's no, no chance for you at that point. Teleports you next to a barb, lol. And then the barb moves before you have a chance. <laughs> well, Tristan, it definitely sounds like this is quite a conundrum, and you're not the only person who would struggle with this, for sure. Oh, but yeah, you're, definitely... you're playing with uh, basically a, a several turn at the start handicap is yeah, long and short of it. But yeah, at least build up the stuff that will let you uh, start placing cities and behaving more like a real civilization in terms of what resources are available to you and production is available to you as soon as you can. And then you'll you'll just be like making up for a bad start, basically. Yeah, and the, the embarkation technologies are pretty early. So you you can usually get those around the time where you would be settling, you know, a third or fourth city anyway. So you might just be behind one city, assuming that you can, you know, there is empty space to get inland. Yeah. If not, I guess sail down to Indonesia or Australia and see if there's anybody there. Yeah, because if Australia's not there, that's a lot of territory to put cities down in. Yeah, uh, and the Philippines too, places like that. Mm -hmm. Maybe try sailing around to India, see if India made it into that map. Man, I don't know if the Philippines would have a lot of production in the in this kind of game setting, though. Australia should be fine. And you, you should be able to reach all that stuff, because that should all be across shallow water from one another, especially if you're not playing on like the biggest map. I think even the biggest map, like from Japan along the Chinese coast to Indonesia and then Australia, there's the, the, nothing like that should be open ocean. Yeah, I would not imagine. I've never played a, a, a true Earth, like gigantic map in Civ 6, so I don't know. But yeah, I would imagine that's all shallow water that you just need the first embarkation tech for. I would believe so, yes. Well, thank you for emailing us, and I'm sorry it took us so long to get to you. Also, sorry to everybody else who wondered if we were dead, because we have been um, beset by difficulties this year. Yeah, I think this is only our second recording since the start of the new year. Yeah, our first one hasn't even been released yet because I've been down, but we can get that fixed pretty quickly, I think. It will be out by the time this is out, hopefully. But we've been here for long enough. It's time for us to say goodbye. Oops, that's me. <laughs> uh, anyways, thank you for uh, listening to episode 397 of Polycast. I'm Makalua, and I'm joined as usual by Canis Albinus. Let's all go to the lobby. Get ourselves a snack, yeah. Me and team? Only building boats because they're military units. Uh, sounds about right. Mega Paris fan. Circling back to our first topic for a bit, uh, Colossal Order, developers of City Skylines, if you're working on City Skylines 2, please put a clock in your UI as well. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sincerely, the management. <laughs> that does not have turns, but I've still one more turned myself in City Skylines to the wee hours of the morning plenty of times as well. Why is it getting lighter in here? There's just a big burning glow called the sun. Oh, crap. Sleep is for the weak. And old. And for yes. people who like to stay sane. Uh, All right, sanity. stream is done. Sanity is optional anyway. It's we fine. did it! We didn't crash! <laughs> we did an episode! <laughs> Huzzah! <laughs> delay, delay, delay episode! Yeah! With all four hosts!
Civilization 3, 4, 5, Beyond Earth, and 6 sound clips. Copyright Take-Two Interactive. Copyright the polycast at thepolycast.net.